So my name is Steve Pulowski. I'm a 24-year Intel veteran. Uh, I uh, run the uh, architecture and planning group for Digital Enterprise. Pat's my boss. Um, roughly a uh, six to seven hundred person organization that's responsible for all our uh, processor, chipset, and board architecture and planning um, uh, within the Digital Enterprise group. Jeff Lowney. Um, Came to uh, Intel through uh, from Digital Equipment Corporation. He runs our uh, software research lab in Massachusetts. Kevin Pond, who is an Intel veteran of almost 30 years, over 30 years. Over 30 years. Uh, he's from Purdue, but we won't mention that. He, uh, I say that because my future son-in-law is going to be from is from Purdue. So. Good choice. Yeah, that's what I said too. I that anyway, uh, Kevin runs the Communications Architecture Lab. He and I, I had the privilege of working with Kevin, uh, managing the group when we first formed and started to drive all the wireless activities. Vijay Bhatt, uh, Intel Fellow, uh, is Director of our IO Architecture. Uh, he's the uh, person in Intel that's spearheading the Genesio program from the technical point of view, so if you have any Genesio questions, they're going right to him. Uh, Knut Grimsrud, Intel Fellow, Storage Architecture. Um, if, uh, if you like serial ATA, this is the man to blame on Intel's side. He's been driving uh, storage interconnect standards and disk technologies for several years now, right now. How many years have you been in Intel? Uh, 13. 13. John Crawford, uh, I always call John Mr. Intel. Um, uh, you know, I, I tell people at Intel that the lights, we owe the lights at Intel to John Crawford and the work that he did on the 386 and virtual. Virtual 86 on the 386 machine when we started to migrate from 16-bit code to 32-bit code. He's one of my favorite guys. Uh, Raj Avatkar. Um, <laughs> no, actually, not. remember that. Uh, <laughs> that was just one time, Raj. <laughs> uh, Raj now is moving over. He comes over from the uh, Systems Technology Lab. He's kind of the jack of all trades. Um, I'll get an email from him that says, I want to talk about networking architectures, and then the next day, hey, we got to talk about power management, and then the next day he starts telling me we have to talk about chassis design. So I don't know what he does, but whatever it does, he's actually very good at it. And he's now migrating over to uh, um, actually run the architecture for our uh, silicon validation team. Now, last but not least, David Cook. If any of you have a computer science background, this man has influenced you. Either you were one of his students, and I met a guy last night who's pretty old who said he was one of David's students, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> or you had a book that was written by David. I know the first computer architecture book I had was uh, by David, and I was so thrilled when he came to Intel because I got to meet the famous David Cook. Um, David has a team in uh, Illinois that's part of the Cook and Associates that focus on high, highly parallel programs and, uh, and tools and development tools for, for uh, parallel applications. So with that, let's open it up to questions. And if they're hard questions, I guarantee one of these other guys will probably get the answer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Phil Gervasi with SimpleTech. Used to be an Intel. in 19 years. Uh, you guys do a lot of great standards. Um, SATA, USB, uh, PCI Express. But memory doesn't seem to have been a real great forte for you guys. We had Rambus, now we have fully buffered DIM, kind of known as Rambus 2. Uh, <laughs> are you guys going to give up on memory, or do you guys have something else up your sleeve? Before I ask that, why am I doing the clip? <laughs> you notice Bill sat down really quickly. Uh, if you have ever shaken Pat Gelsinger's hand, he'll break it. He's got a really good grip, and I finally realized that this is the only way I can get in shape for the next big handshake. Um, memory, does anybody want to take that out? Yeah, so, okay. so, if you look at it, uh, you know, uh, Jetic is the body that has been doing that mission for memory technology for the longest time. Um, you picked out an outlier, uh, Rambus, you know, there was a different arrangement, but if you look at anything else, um, you know, uh, it, it has been you know, working with Jetic that people have brought memory technologies to the industry, right? Uh, what Intel and some of our partners do usually, uh, you know, if you leave out the 
our new app is to really bring system requirements, our knowledge of performance, uh, uh, and the platform architecture to that body. We go there with proposal, the DRM guy show up with what they can build, and that's how most of the DRM set up. Uh, and so there is a body there, and we don't need to create yet another body like PCI SIG or USB IF or anything like that. So uh, I have noticed you were you're with Simple Tech, and of course you guys do a lot of flash-based drives and so on. So I thought I'd uh, also add a secondary uh, answer to your question, and at least make sure that you're aware uh, that uh, Intel is also collaborating with a bunch of uh, industry partners to create a uh, standardized NAND flash interface. I'm sure one thing that you're really having a lot of fun with on your uh, flash-based devices is the fact that every single flash component you get from different vendors, they all behave slightly differently, uh, and it uh, poses some uh, real design nightmares for you, I'm sure. Uh, and so um, um, I just want to make you aware that we, we are uh, pursuing a standard. Uh, it's called uh, ONFI. There was, uh, I think there's a class on it today um, as well. Uh, that's coming along very nicely, and uh, the collaboration there is fantastic. And so we at least have one area of the memory space, or, or a new area of memory space, where there's some new standardization effort happening as well, because the, the, the pressing need to get a little bit of control over that. That's kind of a, a mess right now. We're trying to clean that up a little bit. Sorry, I'm taking your line mic, but Steve and your mic. You don't have a couple. Oh, uh, you can let these guys in on this card, uh, card business? Or no, you can pop that table saw, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, the time frame for ONFI, the, uh, uh, the ONFI initiative was announced that we wanted to start it uh, at last IDF. So that was just six months ago. Uh, right now, the status of the ONFI effort is that we're basically finished the technical essence of the spec. We just, uh, as, uh, I met with the board on Monday, and uh, we approved the 0.9 rev of the ONFI spec. In Intel terminology, 0.9 means that it is finished, other than possible prettying things up with some formatting and, and making some tables prettier or whatever. And so the technical essence of the ONFI spec is actually done now, uh, and we expect that the formatting and the editorial jump will uh, get uh, wrapped up in the next little while. We'll have the spec published probably in Q4. Um, hang on. Bill, did you get your question answered? So the question really was, are we walking away from memory definitions? Or should I walk away from this question? <laughs> By the way, for questions that are of unique value, as judged by me, uh, we actually hand out these gift cards, and I was told by Nathan Brookwood that I helped pay for a refrigerator last year. So. <laughs> I'm going to be a little more uh, particular about the questions. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, Chris Beatham, I'm a 33-year Intel veteran, actually. Uh, my question uh, revolves around interrupt architecture and or the architecture of the platform and where it's going and how we're going to make sure that once we come out with all these quad-core processors that when they get plugged into the platform, they actually get used, they actually get the workload distributed to them effectively. Um, I am concerned that there's going to be a lot of people who plug these things in out there and see no difference in the performance when they go to run their applications operating systems. Thank you. And you're assuming that the applications are running and they're tailored to run on, sure. on multiprocessor systems. So, Raj, you want to take a shot at this David, David. David wants to, yeah. <laughs> well, so there, there are various levels, I guess, that we can look at this. One is um, just at the process level. There are lots of threads alive when you just uh, boot up your machine and start doing anything. And so um, a second core can start doing some of those things if the operating system schedules it and that's that's already happening and then the next level to think about is uh, multitasking where there or, or multi uh, transaction situations where there's just lots of independent things and uh, again the applications are usually written using at the, at the process level and the operating system can take care of it um, in certain enterprise situations, I think transaction processing ones, that can scale and scale and scale. But what do you do about the applications level when we go to four and eight and so on? That's the harder question. That's the one that 
I've uh, been working on for a very long time. And um, so to give a simple answer to that, um, got to have some tools that ISVs can use to work on this problem. And it is a certain amount of work. So we've developed some programming models, uh, OpenMP in the past, on top of uh, POSIX threads or Windows threads. Uh, for C++, we're just coming out of beta on something called uh, Threads Building Blocks, which are a, a runtime library. Uh, for a long time, we've driven the OpenMP standard for th writing higher level threaded programs, C and Fortran with directives. On the Java side, of course, you get lots of threads in the, in the first cases that I mentioned. Uh, uh, the thing that Intel is working, I think, uh, kind of uniquely in the industry on is correctness tools that allow you, that allow an ISV to run a validation suite uh, through a tool that actually finds uh, all of, the, uh, essentially, all of the race conditions and threading errors um, with, in response to a test suite. So you have to use actual data sets, but it's remarkably powerful tool and it's getting a lot better as we put more energy into it. And then finally we have some specific threads based profilers that allow you to look at what the different threads are doing and in, in various views. So um, in the last two years these tools have been taken by the software part of Intel out and we're uh, we've kind of enabled a few hundred ISVs now, and we keep going. So at the, at the two and four-way level, and in some cases, we're trying to scale it beyond that. Uh, I won't give a more elaborate answer, but there's lots of lots of dimensions to the problem, I think, and we're we're working on most of them. Just if I can add one item uh, at the other end of the spectrum, um, one of the other things you have to look a lot of attention to is what the I/O network look, looks like as it comes into those kinds of systems. So. One of the things you saw Pat hold up here in his keynote, the, the JNIC, is an example of a, a lab project that my lab has done. Um, it's one of a series of things we've done, trying to look at what happens to network protocol stacks <coughs> and network traffic in highly parallel systems and many core systems, both in terms of how to organize those, those stacks uh, in order to meet the data rates that we are expected to see on the particularly on optical lines into servers, uh, and also to understand how that traffic can create interference for other tasks running in these many core systems for uh, cache interference and effects like that. So you do have to take a pretty broad platform look for everything, that, you know, from what David was talking about all the way down to sort of how you organize the, the fundamentals of the platform. Just one. Do we have time for one? Okay, and then I have an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> So um, one of the things that, uh, you know, in Pat's talk, we talked about for Geneseo, one of the problems that we're trying to solve is an application accelerator and the host processor is that of efficient uh, synchronization primitives. So, you know, as we roll out more details, you'll see this, but one big uh, improvement area that we're looking at is the reducing inner forehead by uh, having, uh, you know, some of the atomic operations and mapping from the device in the memory space into IO space. If this is in the cache room in the memory space, thereby improving the synchronization uh, the we host and the application solution. Okay. Um, I think one of the things related to your question is when you look at the, a lot of the interrupt traffic, they're in a process of interrupts, and most of them are privilege level promotions and demotions because of the architecture that we had, which is we're going to do lowest in a group on priority and let the hardware decide who's the lowest, who's the, uh, lowest priority uh, controller that can handle that task. So we can kind of do somewhat of distributed interrupt load sharing amongst all the processes. Um, we're having to look at how we do that. And do we continue to maintain that on hardware or do we put more of the burden on the operating system? Uh, we haven't decided yet, but as we look at we certainly, with more cores inside the part, we can move those messages around the chip faster than we can as they go outside. But still, that's a bottleneck. I mean, SPLs happen on the average of every 500 in kernel, kernel instructions, which is really pretty good. Okay. Yeah, I have a question about power management. Um, you've given us some control 
features in the processes with P stakes and C stakes. What about the rest of the system, especially things like memory with FBDIMs, um, IO? Yeah, so we have a very com comprehensive uh, platform for management strategy. Some of the demos you will see in this IDF try to show that that uh, beyond the CPU, uh, we have uh, a manageability engine part of the Vipro, which can help with the platform level power management across both devices, as well as uh, uh, I/O chips uh, and other components of the platform. Pardon? Thinking specifically to servers, rather yeah. than just the desktop platforms or the laptop platforms, there are some unique things. In yeah, so servers also, uh, we have a demo here that we'll be able to see on the memory power management, uh, where we can, uh, independent of the operating system, or uh, we can try to do the memory power management by just observing the memory load uh, across the uh, uh, multiple teams. And that particular uh, example, you'll be able to see in the demos here. In the area of servers, we are also looking at going across the blades within the chassis. So for example, uh, we now have the power management technology which takes into account not just one blade, but looking across the blades. Especially if in a rack, if you see that as you go up in the rack, uh, the heat rises and the blades above in the rack are more susceptible to um, uh, increase heat. And so how to migrate the load between the lower level blades, upper level, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, framework. We're working with other OEMs also on that. Oh, okay. Then this person. Hi. Uh, my name is Anand from the Hindu newspaper in Bangalore. Uh, the changeover or, or, the, or the switch from dual to quad core has happened so dizzyingly fast. It's only in July that most of the world got to use or got, got to get, get to feel dual core, that uh, lay users who at the end of the day form the large majority of Intel's customers, people who buy PCs for home or the office, small office, they can be asked for wondering what on earth they are going to get for these extra four cores. Even now, there are so few applications which are written to take, make optimal use of dual core. We have to sort of grope around to find products and tools which actually work or which work better because they have to be used for double quad. All of a sudden, with three months, six months, the, 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 the user community is being pushed, kicking and screaming into a core core world. And interestingly enough, it's the, the first release is, is a chip which is meant for the gamers and the game developers. The Xeon comes a little later, but by early next year, the rest of the world is all going to be, is being told by Intel, it's dual core on your, on your machine now. What are they going to get? For the next, what extra value are they going to get? And are there going to be enough applications to justify? I'm sure we, we, from where I come, we all know that Intel, like any other American company, operates from the principle that there's ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So they're going to pay a little bit extra for those four cores. What are those are they going to get? And are they really going to feel a difference about having these four cores put into their machines by early next year? I can try. So that's kind of where my previous remark ended, I guess. Uh, it is a big challenge, and because, as we all know, for the last 40 years or whatever, the ISVs have just ridden up the faster processors curve. And so that, that's why I started talking about tools. In other words, I think, I, I, I can say it more strongly, I know that in the 90s, uh, many companies started thinking about thread, threading their programs, big ones, because I was running a small company then, and we had lots of business through lots of OEMs. But, and so today, indeed, there are not very many scalable apps for the desktop. On the other hand, there are very few ISVs who haven't looked at it gotten tremendously burned on the average and said, oh my god, I'm going to put all these locks in there and I'm going to ship this code and it works. So one thing that we do find almost everywhere is uh, experienced people at the ISVs who thought about it, sometimes who say, you've got tools that are going to help this. No way, I don't believe that. So what we've, what we've had to do is Intel has 
I don't know, several hundred application engineers who are stationed at, at all kinds of ISVs. We're actually sending the tool developers out with the AEs to the ISVs and you have to just kind of take them by the hand and go through this stuff uh, one by one, but uh, it, it worked. The tools are actually pretty good. We've been working on this stuff for 15 years or something, so by this time uh, they work pretty well and I can't, there's no, there's no magic here, but the, for, there's lots of people who say, gosh, it's all over because nobody's ever going to do all this work and et cetera. I, I just don't believe that. The future, I think, of, of computing is, is going to be just like the history was. Lots of new stuff. There's a little bit of a change. You don't need every developer to be an expert. You need a, a couple of developers at each ISV who embrace this technology. Another thing I forgot to mention is Intel has thousands of libraries, IPP and MKL, so technical and sort of non-technical libraries, and uh, those teams together with us have been working for a long time to parallelize all of that stuff. So there's actually a lot of software technology upon which people can build, but it's, it takes a while. I guess I'd like to comment on this. That, uh, so David's describing the technology you need to build a parallel program. I think you're asking, you know, assume we have that, why do you need such a fast computer, basically? And uh, the fact that it's a parallel computer just makes it a little more complicated. But you now have an increasing amount of data on your personal computer. And like I run this Google desktop search all the time, which means there's this index engine running. And, that, and that's something that's looking at all the data on my disk and doing some computation on them. So I think if you go, we have a set of demos downstairs that our research lab is doing that shows what you can do with the data that's on your PC. There's something for uh, analyzing videos and finding the highlights. There's something for actually managing your own portfolio or, or collection of uh, digital photographs, which is certainly a problem I have, and maybe yours, of how to organize that and how to search that. So that as you get more data on your computer, there's much more opportunity to analyze it and do creative things with it. And, and there's a lot of research in this machine intelligence now that are doing that. And, and the people that, that, that are working on that will use the techniques that, that, that David's talking about. Okay, I'd like to get John and Kevin involved in this conversation too. So are there any questions concerning? Just to follow on that a bit. Um, uh, with four fours, Okay, now I hope I can get you involved, Kevin. <laughs> well, of course, that one's got to be So, when you've got four cores sitting there, and you've got all this data that you're talking about, and now you have an increasing focus on security, how is Intel as a platform company addressing that concern? One quick question. Are you an Intel person? I am indeed. Okay, I would encourage Intel people to send email privately to us, and we can answer those later. This is more of a form we can get the non-Intel. You used to be an Intel guy. Are you still an Intel guy? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, Rich Brunner, now with VMware. Um, first a plea and, and then a, a quick question. The plea is um, Intel does a lot of clever things on the platform, sort of behind the scenes, uh, that makes things great. but. I guess as a, an OS provider, I would plea for, please at least give us the ability to register for some kind of notification interrupt or a message or something. So if you're doing something clever with power, we might like to know so we don't try to do something similar as far as a Band-Aid solution. The, the question is, if Pat, I think I understood Pat to say that Intel will be looking at secure initialization of hypervisors and bias. And I'm just sort of curious what Intel's view is as far as who signs these things and, and how does that dribble into the infrastructure? Thank you. So I think there are two parts to your question. The first one I want to address is the platform for management mechanisms I, uh, I mentioned. I want to be absolutely clear in um, uh, specifying that we believe in, we provide the mechanisms for both enforcement as well as for implementation. But we believe that the policies on the system are set by the VMM or the operating system vendor. 
And that's where I think we interact with the OS vendors or VMM vendors like you. Many times it's a challenge to work with some of you because I think um, we have good ideas, but they don't match your timeline. So it's always a struggle in terms of how do you match those two things. But we are extremely um, aware of the challenge and we are not in the business of doing system level policies. We do understand that's a function of the operating system of VMM. Okay, but my question is if you throttle something down or you significantly reduce power of something without sort of giving the OS a, oh, by the way, kind of message, yeah, even, that's if, all. even if it doesn't affect functional correctness, that at least that might be appreciated. That might be helpful. Yeah, yeah, that's the whole idea. When we d define the mechanism, we do want to expose to uh, the hooks to those mechanisms or the knobs to those mechanisms through some interface to the operating system. Mm -hmm. So the whole platform power management, I don't know whether you have been involved in discussion. We have had discussions with at least the OS vendors, uh, especially Microsoft okay. in that particular area. Let, let, me, but, okay. let me try again. I'm familiar... I'm familiar where the OEM, through BIOS, through firmware, will end up, or through some hardware-based mechanism, will change the state of the platform. And that's what I'm asking for, is still the ability of some way to be able to drive that state change into the processor so the OS is aware. I'll shut up. Okay. Got the request. Did he answer your question? I think he understands my pain. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I really want to get Kevin and John involved in the conversation. So if you have a wireless question or a specific CPU architecture question, please raise your hand. Okay, I'm Jim Burton from Ideas International. And uh, obviously we're on a pathway going to multi cores per socket. I'd like to understand at what point are we going to hit a wall or will we have something like a Moore's Law that just keeps on scaling up and up and up? And what are some of the technical issues that you're going to be encountering as you go to uh, 16 processors, 13 processors per, per core, I mean per socket? Here you go, John. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've already discussed a lot of the software issues um, and, and touched on a couple of uh, some of the system level uh, type of issues. One of the big challenges of the multi-core uh, chip at, uh, effort at Intel, at least from my perspective, uh, from Intel's perspective, we do processors. We've done them well for a long time. Uh, so putting more cores on is more of a step and repeat kind of a challenge. Uh, that's the easy part. The hard part is how do you connect them? How do you interconnect them? How do you feed them data? Um, how do you manage the, the shared data traffic uh, uh, among various levels of cache on that chip? How do you provide bandwidth off chip to memory and to, and to other parts of the system. So that's a, a, a big challenge. Um, and you know, uh, one of the things we've got uh, going in our favor here is we can learn as we go. So you know, we, start, we, 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 ha we know how to do that with one chip. We've done that for a few decades. Uh, you know, we've got two chips now, and that, that brings some issues up. And we've, we've talked about our cache technology that, uh, uh, that we've built in to, to make that smarter. And we just need to get smarter and smarter, and double our smartness uh, on that interconnect as we go forward. Um, what are the limits? Certainly one limit is power, and that's uh, power and area is, is limiting us now to two and, and soon to four. Uh, some of the second order effects in terms of data bandwidth and, and such uh, is going to be uh, challenges for us to, to look into, but I, I'm confident that we'll, uh, we'll learn as we go and, and figure out how to do that and deliver the the, uh, the bandwidth and the communications that's necessary for that. Kevin, okay. you have the mic. Do you want to add anything to that? Marsh? Oh, the mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I, I promised him first, and I'll come back to you. Morning. I'm Jim Matthews with Matthews Associates, uh, Server Memory Consulting. Uh, thanks for taking time to uh, meet with us and answer our questions, hopefully. Um, in the press, we've heard mention of microbuffers, and I was wondering uh, if you were designing a microbuffer-based uh, RDIM, uh, what kinds of features would you like to see in that, and how would you position the, uh, an RDIM-based uh, system for servers versus uh, fully buffer-based? Distribute the question. <laughs> um, 
You know, I hate to tell you this, Jim, but I'm not aware of the con of the term microbuffer. Can you give me a little more context on that? Um, it was mentioned as a potential replacement or alternative to the fully buffer gym yeah. and uh, an enhancement to the art gym solution. Okay. So, so okay, here. Yeah, I guess Rose is a flower of my name. So yet another buffer concept, but we use the power and we use the overhead that we get the fully buffered down. Um, we are actually going to have one more, one more idea. Uh, in JEDIC, there's been some discussion of combining the PLL and register to uh -huh. simplify and improve the performance of our games. So, yeah, there are other things that might happen. You know, one of the benefits that I don't think is really appreciated by fully buffered down is the fact that your memory reliability goes up exponentially. Okay, because now we can do we can we can test for errors like dim unseating problems because we can check and correct ECC as it comes out of the dim itself versus somewhere down the line. Or if the dim is bad, we know we're pushing good stuff going forward. So you know fully buffered dim, so the buffers like that have a good concept. They allow us to increase the capacity of the channel and they allow us to be able to keep the bandwidth up without adding more and more dims. So yeah, there are different concepts that we're throwing out and we're looking at. Power is a big issue, as everybody knows. Um, when fully buffered DIMM was specified, it was specified as a server memory and performance in terms of capacity and bandwidth were, were paramount. Okay, power being a larger issue, so a lot of the structures, the buffers, and the clocking scheme, on-chip clocking, were defined for that. And we're having to go back in and re readdress that. Now, whether that's FBDM2, whether that's a new buffer, that's a new version of registered DIMM that we built that into the buffers themselves of the DIMMs, whether we merge the PLLs, and PLLs are not easy technologies to deal with. Okay. And you want to make sure that and when you put them on uh, different process technologies, they tend to not behave very well either. So I think there are a lot of different alternatives that we're looking at. Uh, I don't think there's a definite answer yet, um, but you know, certainly, the memory initiatives that are done in Intel are actually run on my team, and so I have a number of engineers that are focusing on the different problems. Will that answer your question? Okay. Uh, one of the things that I happen to be uh, familiar with and just very happy about is to see that Intel has learned that either you run as fast as you can or you sort of just sit back and get slapped. Uh, Intel in January came out with Core for the, for the notebook, and I mean, hardly a few months later, it's core two already, and now we're talking about quad before the end of the year. So I mean, bang, 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 which is great if you want to bury the competition, which is, if I'm an economic guy, I want to do that. But on the side where you take a look at your core logic coming up, I wonder why Intel is not optimizing its solution. I'm talking a little bit out of turn here, but uh, you, as you know, Intel roadmaps turn up on the web almost as quickly as they are published out to their customer base. Take a look at what's coming up in the next round of CoreLogic, and you say, "Hey, I've got guess what? I've got a new front side bus, and another really big stumbling block is I've got a new memory architecture coming up, a new faster BIM that doesn't fit in the same in, in, as far as design <coughs> solution." But Intel, if I take a look at Intel's motherboards that are going to be coming out at the same time, only one of them is taking the approach of the memory architecture, and none of them, if I take a look, for, if I take a look at the socket that's going to get filled, the processors out there are, are not going to be running at the front side bus. So why aren't you running at the speed you can, given your core logic? Why aren't you planning to anyway? <clears throat> there are a lot of thoughts in there. <laughs> I think I'm going to give you back the mic and ask you to condense it down into one thing because I kind of got lost in trying to translate it. You were moving faster than my poor brain. Okay. If, if, you, if your philosophy has changed to run as fast as you can, which seems to be what's happened this year, why, as you look to next year, when you've got a new core logic coming out, why aren't your motherboards and your implementation of that technology, why aren't they matching your capabilities? Okay. Why aren't they planned to do that? I, I did a stint in the division, so I mean... Oh, that makes you an expert in that. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, uh, if you look at how the motherboard business works, usually, you know, uh, these motherboards 
um, are highly customized towards OEMs than buy it. So clear roadmap and you know the SKUs that you see on the web versus you know what they sell is what the you know. A lot of times, you know, if you work with some OEM in China or some OEM, OEM in Korea, they all have their own configurations. And then Intel, you know, on the website, what you see is the stuff that we sell to retail based on in our analysis. So please don't um, equate, you know, the progress on our, or lack of progress on the motherboard side with, you know, our roadmap. Um, they, just try to follow the business model that they work with. Yeah, and kind of to build up on that, to see if I interpret your question correctly. Um, you know, it all depends on the economies of those businesses. The, uh, you know, there are certain technologies, for example, there are certain technologies that we've had around for a long time that we've got a great infrastructure in our factories to be able to take advantage of. We can turn products based on those technologies really quickly. And then when you look at the needs of the particular segment that, um, that we're trying to address, some technologies and migrating those technologies to, to faster processors, different cores, et cetera, are more important than, say, changing other parts of the subsystem. So really what it ends up being is focusing on what makes sense for that particular business segment, change what really needs to be changed, because when you have to go through and you have to change that whole validation infrastructure, which is why I'm glad Raj is working on validation. Validation is a big problem. Every time we change something, the amount of suites we have to run to make sure that we run software that was written 10 or 15 years ago becomes horrendous. And we're trying to improve that. So if we try to change as little as possible, when it makes economic sense to change, we'll, have, we'll make that transition. Wow. Bill, you've already asked a question. I'm sorry. You don't get another card. Uh, John Mashey, TechVisor, never an Intel person. Um, <laughs> so, so, so two, two quick questions, uh, one on memory and one on back on parallelism. Um, the memory one is uh, uh, SO DIMMs in laptops. Um, as an old systems guy, it makes me nervous to have a couple gigs of memory and no ECC, for instance. Right? Can you guys address that? Should I be getting nervous? Uh, you know, are, the, are the numbers getting better? And given in the old days, that much memory, we, we worry a lot, right? Uh, and the second one is back to the parallelism thing, maybe for David. Um, you know, beyond the classic technical codes that you worked on for so many years, can you sort of sort what you're seeing in terms of progress in different application spaces? Like, I'm not really expecting Word real quick to be, you know, parallelized, right? Um, but, but, but if you can sort of sort through the applications where you see people making progress, that would be good. Uh, I'm going to let John handle the memory reliability one, and then. So it, it turns out in, in uh, DRAM technology, the, the the scaling reliability has followed pretty much the scaling of the cells. Uh, in other words, the, the the failure rate per chip has stayed pretty constant over the last uh, 10, 15 years or so. So you really shouldn't be concerned about the number of bits you have. You really should be concerned how many chips you have, which really hasn't changed, and if anything, maybe it's come down a bit. So that's uh, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind. That's in contrast to uh, static RAM technology, where the, the failure for bits been more or less constant. Uh, you know, if you had SRAM in your laptop, you, you should you have a you know a much cause for concern. But the DRAM cells, uh, for various reasons, maybe the most important one is they've got a big capacitor there, don't hold a lot of charge. It, it's not. Uh, it, it's a, a per chip thing, it's not a per cell thing. So this is the same same subject that I talked about twice and Jeff uh, said something about... They must not be satisfied with your No, answer. no, right. <laughs> we'll, we'll try some more. Um, as Jeff made a, an observation that I just kind of touched on and let me continue on that subject. So if I have a single um, data structure, and I work like the devil on the code for the rest of my life, I can only wring out so much performance. Uh, that is, technical computing has always been driven by uh, first, getting all you can out of a program, or I, sh I should say second, by all you can get out of the program, first by just more data. So all the, you know, fluid dynamics when you go from two dimensions to three dimensions, hey, we can, we can um, 
there's another multiplicative factor on the number of processors a big computer can use. So there has been over the last 10 years lots of lots of uh, crepe hanging and negativism about gosh Microsoft doesn't see any need for more processors for Windows or for uh, spreadsheets or for Office. And so, and so you can just kind of put your head in the sand and say, yeah, well, it's all over. Um, the, the, th the thing you have to look for is areas where lots of data is expanding right before our eyes and new applications because, indeed, there's a selling checker um, you know, just like a hand calculator only needs so much computational power and at some point it, it's all over. Um, and so John's question was, what are these areas? And um, uh, as part of this activity that I mentioned earlier, going out and talking to ISVs, I actually do have these, so I, I think of them, of, of opportunity. And I won't... Um, start into a, a long lecture about what they all are, but just about the process. You go to almost all IS are kind of large and say, now that's your product, what are your advanced development ends? Because I've got 16 or 32 cores coming, and you can get a lot of interesting ideas, and if you work with them, I think Intel is in the process of trying to get some of them to move ahead. Uh, but an example, I, I think, I think uh, Jeff mentioned photos, uh, but just think about Google or Google Earth and think about uh, geospatial data mining. That's a subject that, that's one area that I've been looking into a lot. I've got some parallel data mining people uh, going and there are a number of companies that uh, take maps and do things with them and that's a gigantic amount of data that people never even thought about five years ago. Now you can get it on your desktop and you can get, uh, just to go one step farther, you can get 20 different kinds of uh, weather and uh, geophysical alerts. You can get traffic information. So in a location aware sense, think of a car driving down the street, updating uh, uh, a map with all kinds of local information. So, and the data structures are such, and the amount of data is such, that um, there is a non-trivial amount of computing to be done in these things. I won't, I won't elaborate anymore, but there are lots of examples. Yeah. Okay, I would really like a wireless question. Now, if you're raising your hand to say, I got a wireless question, and it becomes a CPU question, you do not get a wireless question. You got a wireless question? Here's one. The back, at the back. Oh, sorry about that. Then I'll come back. Why do I think I'm supposed to be holding the mic? <laughs> Hi, Matt Sullivan from Denmark. I have a question about the Santa Rosa platform and 802.11m. Uh, are you planning to ship 802.11m before it's finally ratified by the IEEE? I, with, that's really more of a product question. I don't want to speak to their product ship timelines, but as far as I know, yeah, they'll ship products ready, the, just like everybody else is. Uh, the uh, IEEE is kind of, they, they, they work for their own drumbeat in terms of actually voting approval of these things. And I think pretty much everybody is committed to ship dates that are not predicated on what the final date looks like. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, you can get it from IEEE specifically for, for, for our guys. Hi, Ted Carlson. Uh, no, I haven't worked for, for Intel. Uh, That's too bad. I did one work for Microsoft, so there's a different question. So I can answer one of the questions that people have been asking about what are the difficult applications. First, Office is multi threaded, has been since uh, 93, 94, because NT Workstation supported multiple cores at that time. The workstation supported two cores. So Office, you know, Word is background pagination, spelling, thesaurus, all that stuff is all multi threaded. Um, uh, Excel and everything else does the same thing. Other point is the future applications, think of voice recognition, natural speech language, pattern recognition, anticipating the user, artificial intelligence type, thinking ahead of the user uh, as far as things, what to do with all these additional threats. But now my question is, so that might help. I was going to say, we questions. should get you an apron. So, <laughs> so the, the question comes is, 
you know, Intel's worked in cadence for so long that the industry has kind of gotten used to that, and that, that predictable pattern was something that people planned on. Now we've kind of moved and accelerated that ahead of that so that the tools that, David, that you're talking about, some of the software companies working on the compilers and the parallelism aren't going to be there for a couple of years because the cadence was set, and so our plans have been set. What should we be thinking about as far as design issues, especially on the client? I think server we can keep using all the cores for a while. It's going to be like a two-year delay where the four cores and stuff can really say we're slamming the, you know, the processors finally again. It takes a little while to catch up to that. What else should we be thinking about, though, in designing applications and developers thinking about? Is it I.O. and is it how do we get out on the network and how do we get onto the bus? What are these other, I mean, obviously the interconnect with the processors and we're prepared for that. But what are the other areas we should be looking at that we're not thinking about? Jeff, you want to take a start at this? I think as we, maybe John mentioned before, the, the biggest problem with the multi-core system is going to be getting the data into it. So it's really the ratio of computation to memory bandwidth or even disk I.O. bandwidth. So you, you actually want to develop applications that use much more computation than need to read from memory. You, you need to be able to work out of the caches and stay on die much more than in the current systems. So, so I think that's the major way to think. And, and actually, if you're designing parallel programs, a difference of these multi-core systems is that, uh, that since they're sharing resources, and particularly sharing the cache, you want all of the processors, if possible, working on the same piece of data. Whereas today, when you parallelize a program, you typically break it up so that everyone works on a different piece of data. So there's a different way of thinking about programming, parallel programming, that, that's going to come through the industry over the next few years. And, and I think that's something we're working on. Okay, the question is, where's Intel heading? You know, we're, besides, we know about the parallel yeah. and concurrent computing models, and we're working, I mean, Intel's done a great job of working with us on that. But are there other things at the processor level, I.O. systems, for example, came to mind? Yeah, one, one thing you should keep in mind is that the flash technology. With Robson, we are introducing a new paradigm in the memory hierarchy. And that addresses Jeff's problem about how do you get data for concurrent data processing. So I think the flash, in the increasing use of flash in the platform is a great opportunity, and just from a platform design perspective. There, there's also, I mean, I think the, the I.O. question is also going to be an interesting one, or networking and I.O. one. Uh, you know, we are seriously looking at both in the general case and, and then more specifically in the Geneseo's context, um, what the right arrangement of coherency is between elements in the what is traditionally thought of as the I.O. part of the system and the core part of the system. How do you, how do you deal with very high data, data rate communication lines? Now that takes you a little bit back more toward the servers, but, but if you look at what is it going to take to terminate a 10 gigabit uh, line, uh, the packet handling overheads become often more than a single processor really wants to handle. So how do you reorganize and restructure the termination structures of packet handling and protocol processing? Uh, and that's both a software issue, uh, but it's, and, 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 a, and a hardware issue in terms of how do you want coherency to exist between NICs, where the NICs exist, what do the traffic patterns look like. So I think one of the things that is going to happen, and this is a slightly longer term view of it, but um, we, we've been in a situation for a long time where processors were faster than any of the comm lines. It, as you go forward, the aggregate of the Processing complex is much faster than the comm line, but an individual core may not be. And so the way in which that whole structure has to evolve, I think, is still one that we have to do quite a bit of work on across the industry in terms of how do we rethink handling these very high, high data rate lines into systems where individual cores, you know, typically we single thread to a first approximation our network stacks. That's probably not what the network stack looks like six, seven years from now. So how do we get from here to there, both in the software structures and in the hardware structures? We've been doing a bunch of stuff in that space in the labs, and we think we're going to see more of that. That's great. Thank you. Uh, so, if I could, wow. uh, I have one more <laughs> <laughs> this is a opportunity, um, you know, and I'll give you specific examples how we can speed things up. So this morning we talked about Geneseo, uh, and a big part of Geneseo is not just interconnect. Interconnect is the way to get an accelerator, you know, populated in the machine and, you know, talking to uh, the accelerator. 
the bulk of the work that we need to do, because that is the bottom like this in the software layer. When you look at the application running, take any application, you know, may that be next generation media processing, or XML, or crypto, or any, anything else that you can imagine that requires special purpose acceleration. The biggest problem is communication between the, you know, the, the system and the application. Let's just put it down, that includes both hardware and software. And the latencies as seen by applications are so large that we have to think about having a very lightweight communication mechanism. And that's where most of the opportunities are, that's where the challenges are, and we look forward to working with Microsoft and other ISVs to make that happen. Okay, so one more and then we'll one in the, what, the, the, we talked an awful lot, we got a lot of response here on the different technology aspects to work with you on. Um, one thing, I, the only thing I remember about your question now is what does Intel want developers to do? And I think the, uh, to add on top of this, one thing that Intel, uh, we can help you with a lot of this stuff, but one thing we can help you with is the imagination and the, uh, and the creativity and, and knowing how to go out and reach new applications, reach new customers. And I think that's, at the end of the day, maybe that's the most important thing we want developers to do. Very nice. So, okay. my question was uh, based on the comments you made uh, on Geneseo. There was a talk about opening the front side bus to allow uh, FPGAs to interconnect with them. Uh, where do you see uh, the accelerators adding value, considering the fact uh, that we are rapidly moving toward multi core uh, processors? We are uh, incorporating SSE4 uh, instructions that can help. Uh, <laughs> take over some of the advanced processing. So how do we decide on which applications uh, should be handed over to an accelerator and rather than coding in the main uh, processor architecture? And secondly, uh, uh, where do you see the accelerators impacting uh, the multi-threaded model? So I don't want to have an accelerator uh, that accelerates one thing and then completely destroys my uh, threading model and uh, makes the processors uh, less optimal. So I think one answer to your question is uh, we think accelerators can plug in to areas where there's uh, very computationally intensive and where it's more of a fixed or uh, it's a fairly <coughs> small defined or well defined uh, uh, not quite fixed function, but a, a very well-defined computation. Uh, maybe talk about image processing or some uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, intensive scientific kind of com com computation where the it, it's more computation intensive and not so memory intensive. So we see those kind of areas. And the answer to the other question, one of the things we're, we're focused in and why we're, we think it's important for us to, to drive this uh, uh, communication standard is that we can then provide smooth integration with with our processors to avoid the, the, the serial bottleneck. Why Keep not working well? Why not dedicate one core though? To yeah. Yeah. Uh, just a, just a general observation, and I mean, ultimately, of course, it's the guy who's off thinking he can build and sell a accelerator profitably was to make his choice, right? But I, I'm, I will make a general observation. Uh, you wanna, you really wanna stay out of the way of the. Um, the, the juggernaut, if you will, of the central CPU performance advance, unless you have a very good reason for understanding why the accelerator gives you value. And there are some, but historically, you, you got to choose carefully. So reasons for choice, um, very specific logic that because of its nature allows you to do something in a parallel manner that is not replicatable in any easy way serially, and therefore you get an inherent performance improvement. Uh, something where dedicated logic has a big power differential to you, uh, where, the, where the general purpose stuff, even with all the work we're doing on power efficient processing, is simply not going to give you the, the power advantage that you get out of doing it in, in an accelerator. Uh, bad reasons to do it, I think, are that you see a brief moment in time where you can, uh, you know, be 20% faster. Uh, you know, my favorite example of this is Toe, which has kind of reappeared time after time after time, the TCP offload stuff. And every time it shows up, you know, you just have to stand around for about, eight, you know, six or eight months, and the central system goes right by you. Uh, you know. One of my favorite things to point out to people is that in this industry, particularly regarding CPU performance, uh, performance equals time. 
And so if you move your product introduction by a few months, your performance equation has radically changed. I mean, you're seeing that certainly as the comment earlier on, on single core, dual core, quad core. So I think you, you really have to look carefully at the unique value that an accelerator brings. There clearly are some, but you know, be, be cautious that it's not just a point in time uh, performance you know, window that's going to close on top of you very quickly. Quick comment on that was uh, Intel was a player in the network processor business in the communication side, and you mentioned the protocol stack a number of times. So where do you see that integration going? Do you see the network processors falling out of favor? And you believe the network processors? Well, the network processors really have, have historically been, been aimed at a little bit different place. They're kind of the pump and the wire sort of applications where they're doing uh, pack, yeah, wireline speed packet spec stuff. However, if you look at what we're doing in terms of a lot of our analysis in the main core environment for networks, it's stuff we learned from the, from the network processor environment. I mean, we've used some of the very same tools, uh, same kind of simulation analysis, and you know, a lot of the structuring learning we've applied. As we go to many core, a lot of those same ideas that you saw in the processing engine view of the world at the bump and the wire level apply to many core. So we only have time for one more question. Coral Sam has just been anxious here, so here you go. Well, it's a terrible question. Okay, we'll give you that question. <laughs> <laughs> he still needs a new tab. Assuming I'm talking. My name is Sam Carswell from Formation. I have a Robson question. Uh, we design embedded servers that are running Windows, and uh, that marketplace lags the rest of the marketplace by uh, by a few years because of its using. ETX form factors, et cetera, compact PCI. And, but we'd like to see Robson right away. It, it makes a big difference in our marketplace with slow disks. So what are the, I saw yesterday's diagram showed the, the SATA drive, the serial ATA driver, and Robson, there's this whole line going between them. What kind of problems are either business or software problems will I have trying to bring Robson to an existing serial ATA Windows platform that's running Vista, but the rest of that will hook up? Uh, darn good question, since it's a question for me. That was a good one. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I know that we're running really short on time. We're, we're getting the new signal and stuff in the back, okay? And so um, I just want to first let everybody know that we're having another one of these shop talks in the morning. And tomorrow morning, uh, I get to MC, so tomorrow every question will be a storage question. <laughs> <laughs> and it will be answered in 10 minutes or more. <laughs> So uh, your question is probably a little more detailed than I think uh, we could do it justice here. So I don't know if you have a chance to also stop by in the morning. Is that all right? I'll ask you afterwards also. Oh, yeah, sure. But you don't need another card for that. Oh, okay. So <laughs> with, um, uh, with the, um, the driver architecture for the initial Robson solution is a, a little bit of interesting architecture because the, the Robson um, cache does not sit on the same bus that it's caching. Robson sits on the PCI and the storage device hangs on the serial ATA. As a result, the driver architecture becomes a little bit interesting. Like you saw in the picture you were referring to, there's a Robson driver, there's a serial ATA driver, and the two drivers essentially communicate with each other. So storage requests that are heading down the serial ATA stack, they get intercepted and they get diverted to the Robson stack based on the caching policies that are there. Um, we're not aware of any issues with that driver model with, uh, with Microsoft Vista. And uh, from uh, what I understand from various announcements so on from Microsoft is that uh, uh, they're indicating that, uh, um, uh, that there aren't any barriers uh, to Robson being supported on Vista and having all the various uh, kinds of uh, um, uh, whatever their uh, approvals and logos and things like that are. And so uh, there really aren't any barriers to, to that all working. And uh, I think you saw all the demos and so on were done on Vista in the uh, class earlier. Okay. You might get another card for so. Anyway, we are getting the hook. I uh, appreciate everybody coming and spending some time with us. I uh, hope we answered your questions as uh, candidly as you were expecting. And, uh, thanks again. And again, shameless advertisement tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, I think it's first thing in the morning. Um, I grab your breakfast, and I think at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning we're doing this again. Uh, new, new cast of characters. New cast of characters. So. Yeah.